Welcome to the Nonprofit Report, your weekly update on nonprofit organizations, issues, and leaders. I'm your host, Mark Oppenheim. Today, we will talk about empowering girls through the Girl Scouts with special guests, Meredith Mascata, CEO of Girl Scouts of Greater New York, Lydia Soto Harmon, CEO of Girl Scouts of the Nation's Capital in Washington, D.C., and Marina Park, CEO of the Girl Scouts in Northern California. So thank you all for joining us. This is wonderful. I get to speak with Girl Scout leaders, half, half the yeah. people in the world, right? Empowering girls. Um, <laughs> let's talk about Girl Scouts and let's talk about how that experience can be so important to an empowered life uh, going forward. Uh, so uh, can, can we start off with you, Meredith, and, and just talk about what the Girl Scouts means to you and to the people that you serve? Sure, absolutely. First of all, thank you so much. It's it's such an honor to be here and, of course, to be surrounded by my, my sister CEOs, Lydia and Marina. Um, we've been separated normally during a year. We will be we would be face to face together, um, but uh, we are all staying well connected and lifting up each other's best practices, uh, keeping the girls at the center of our focus. Uh, so I am a third generation Girl Scout, a Gold Award Girl Scout myself. Uh, I am the mother of five current Girl Scouts and the proud CEO of Girl Scouts of Greater New York. Um, so needless to say, Girl Scouting has been uh, a consistent through line in my life uh, as a product of the program. Um, and, you know, being a CEO of Girl Scouts of Greater New York, we have a vision here, which is to create a New York City in which every girl feels empowered to lead in her community, the workplace, and the world. And uh, our focus in our programs in New York City is really about going beyond the periphery to make sure that we are reaching every girl in every community so that they feel welcome to be part of the program and that we create an equitable space for them to uh, start on their leadership journey. So, it, you know, it, to me, it's so, it's so interesting to watch these debates unfold about, um, about uh, people of different genders and their identity and their empowerment. And, and this is a movement that has been around for a really long time. And it, it, it really is all about empowerment, isn't it, Lydia? Yes, it absolutely is all about empowerment. And, you know, it, during these COVID times, it has been, I would say my colleagues will agree, it's been very challenging because, you know, we have, uh, you know, we've had to find new ways to reach the girls that, that, that need our help. And some of it uh, has created some mental health challenges for young people. We know that, you know, perspective comes with age. And when you're going, when you're young, and this is, you know, and, and having to be sort of with your uh, parents for a whole year in your house, that could be, that could be really hard. But, but also just all the, you know, I call them the rites of passage that young people are missing, you know, uh, you know, whether it's a bridging ceremony for a Girl Scout event or a graduation, whether it's from middle school or high school, or, you know, just even the prospect of going off to college when that means that you are actually going up to your bedroom and sitting in your childhood bed doing, you know, college level work. So I think Girl Scouts has really tried uh, to find ways that we can create resiliency and normalcy and uh, and really get girls outside. I mean, that's one of the, I know that all three of us have worked really hard to try to find ways that that we can provide opportunities for girls to be girls and to and to create relationships and friendships because, you know, yes, we are all about leadership, but we know that in life, what carries us into the future is those those meaningful relationships and those bonds that we create that then give us a sounding board when things are tough or when we don't know what is the right decision to make. So hopefully, um, I'm just so grateful to so many troop leaders who have really sort of stepped up during this difficult time to provide that for girls and for all the Girl Scout councils across the country that have, you know, through incredible CEO leaders like my colleagues have also worked really hard to, to provide those opportunities for girls. Why is it important, uh, Marina, to uh, that girls have a, a, a space that is uh, reserved for them? Um, and and um, what could you just sort of observe some of the differences? Um, you know, we, we've gone through a society, these uh, different phases, sometimes where we think that there's a real distinction between um, male and female uh, genders and other genders. And sometimes where we think that, well, there's really no difference 
Um, could you talk a little bit about that that whole topic and about this sort of safe space for for girls and and also the enriching space for girls? Not just that it's safe, but it's also in many respects um, it allows for a, a certain expression that that and a certain exploration um, uh, by girls. Yeah. You know, we um, know from many years of talking with parents and girls that what they want is to get outdoors with outdoor skills. And that's probably something that, you know, both boys and girls want. Um, they want civic engagement. They want to be empowered to make a difference in their communities. And the third priority is a safe space for girls. And by safe space, of course, physical safety is really important, but also emotional safety. And I think I get the best answers when I ask girls that question. Mm -hmm. um, and particularly high school girls who've come through the program and they are participating in a lot of co-ed debate team and other activities. And so what is it about Girl Scouts that helps them? And I left something one of the young women said who actually served on our board she said, you know, um, I'm afraid of heights. And when I jumped off the um, zip line at camp and all of my sister Girl Scouts were cheering me on, I figured out that I'm braver than I know that I am, especially when I have people supporting me. And she said that courage I discovered in myself has helped me be successful in all of the other things that I'm doing in my life. She said, I wouldn't have had the courage to do that if I was in a co-ed environment because I would have been worried about people seeing me be afraid um, my fellow, you know, I would have, I wouldn't have had the same comfort level and I would have had a greater fear of failure. And so that's a lot of what we hear from girls is that they discover their confidence and their courage by being in that all girl space, by having that safe space. And then they take that out into the world. <laughs> you know, we know it's a co-ed world, but, um, but it, it gives them that kernel of, of courage. And I think that's just super important. And that's what we hear over and over again from, from our girls. Can we talk a little bit about uh, social imprinting and imprinting um, our legacy as as um, as older folks um, really imprinting well, our speak for yourself? Our... I'm not older, Mark. Oh, okay, well, yes, I am. <laughs> only speaking for me, right? But but the adults, I mean, our, part of our job as parents is to teach our children things, and and of course, as the children grow older, they they tell us that some of the things we're teaching them is kind of old hat and outdated and so on. Um, when, when you're managing a program like this, there is a balance to be reached uh, between um, teaching our impressions that come out of the past and equipping girls for the future. Uh, Lydia, um, how do you see this, this balance? So it's so interesting. I mean, to Marina's point about learning from girls, so I have a girl who did who her gold award project, which is our highest earned award in Girl Scouting, was to do a podcast about immigrants and refugees and telling their stories because she feels that there's so much misunderstanding. And so she really wanted to do this. And so as an immigrant myself, she interviewed me for this podcast. And I tell a story that my whole life I thought was a funny story. My, my parents are from Cuba. And my father, when he would speak sometimes, especially, you know, we were in, in, the, in the deep south in Mississippi and in Tennessee, they would hear his accent and people would be like, oh, I don't know if I can understand. And he would always say, have you heard of Ricky Ricardo? I am, you know, and that's how he would sort of, you know, make people feel comfortable with him. And so I'm telling you, Lena, the story and this Girl Scout says to me, Lydia, that's such a sad story. This is what happens to immigrants. They're always you know, it's like in my, she's Korean American, it's like my community, we're always changing our names to Julie and Kimmy and things that people can pronounce because we're afraid to be who we really are. And your father was doing that. He was trying to get acceptance by making self-deprecating humor. How sad. And I had never, and this is what is so amazing about learning from, from young people. I had never uh, thought of that story in that way. You know, that in fact, she is teaching me about resilience and stories that we tell ourselves about our own growing up uh, are now interpreted in a different, I mean, we're living in a different world where mm -hmm. some of those things that they are experiencing and that they're living through uh, have an impact in a way that I, I mean, I, I just, I learned from her that day that, you know, some of the ways that I interpret things are not the same way that, that she's living them. 
Well, you also get a new appreciation of the heroism of your father having finding a way to navigate those times, right? I mean, that's that, that's the aha moment, right? The, the, right. the truths sort of coexist. Um, Meredith, how do you, how do you see this whole idea of of sort of the uh, what that Lydia uh, points out, kind of the bi directional education that uh, we give as we try to also give education? Yeah, thank you for that. This is this is great, and Lydia. Thank you so much for sharing that. That's uh, it is so powerful, um, and I think one of our our best mission moments are when every day we get to learn from the girls, realizing that the mentoring path it's a two way street, and we are at uh, such an amazing moment in time where we have the largest amount of generational spans, and as an organization as old as ours, we see. And we have touch points with every single one of those generations uh, because the organization is so uh, has 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 been so long standing. Um, but we also have this generation that is like no other, and you know, labeled the social justice generation, where we have to learn from them of what they want their future to be like. And I think that listening listening to their needs, but also teaching them and going back to the history of our organization and pointing out and making sure that the systemic issues that have been part of our culture uh, for years are pointed out, are discussed and are given that, have them find the solutions for those systemic issues so we can move forward um, in the way that there is needed for the girls. By the way, we just finished a, a poll in which we asked uh, respondents uh, whether um, an all girls environment empowers or disempowers 100% uh, responded in powers. We don't get 100% that often. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, so that was that was a very interesting uh, response. Um, there have been some challenges uh, in the scouting movement when it comes to safety. Um, how do you uh, ensure that your environments are built to assure the safety uh, of your girls um, and ensure that they not only have fun, but their parents who drop them off um, can just go home and, and feel completely relaxed about about that experience. Marina, you want to you, you care to take that that whole approach of, of uh, physical safety and and safe space? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, well, physical safety, you know, I think and and uh, emotional safety. I think it really starts with culture and a culture of safety and a culture of accountability. And if you see something or feel something uh, that doesn't feel right, you report it and we do something about it and we, and we take action. And that, that's the starting point is that is our culture. We do the right thing. And um, we've even used that you know, with, the, with COVID and our council, you know, we're Girl Scouts, we do the right thing. Uh, we do the right thing, not only for ourselves, but for our community. We are not going to meet in person right now. We're not gonna contribute to community spread. So that's been our, mantra that's our culture and that that's the kernel of that of that safety is that culture of accountability and then of course we have all the protocols in place for um, background screening of volunteers um, all of the safety activity checkpoints training requirements for physical activities keeping girls safe we have a really strong safety record um, in girl scouts i'm proud to say as a youth serving nonprofit, we're able to get insurance to cover um, things like sex abuse because it's so so rare in our in our organization um, that we can get you know, we can get insurance and then there's um, emotional safety which is so important and that's been an area we're doing really a lot of work as uh, particularly I would say in the area of gender identity a lot of education required to really help uh, our volunteers understand what it is to support a transgender girl. We're very clear in our council that if you can't learn, we understand everyone makes mistakes, but if you can't learn um, how to be anti-racist and how to be inclusive and how to welcome every girl into the organization, then this is not the right organization for you. So again, it goes to culture, but I would say empathy with understanding that not everyone is as far along the journey, so they have to be open to education. And then when, uh, you know, when they disagree and it doesn't work, we're not going to be the right organization for everyone. So that's really how we work towards safety. And then again, listening to our girls. We just did our annual meeting, um, had nine older girls lead a one hour discussion with what they want our culture to be like, you know, for them, super powerful. You know, one of the things that Marina talks about that I have uh, 
also started to talk about here is, uh, and it's through some really hard work that her council has done around uh, around some of these issues, is that, you know, and the way that I present it might not be exactly the way you present it, Marina, but that, you know, we are through welcoming, you know, people to the organization. We need to work harder to make sure that people feel a sense of belonging. There's a big difference. Big difference. Being welcoming and, and having a sense of belonging. I think as an organization and as a movement, we need to move to that place where every girl, no matter her background, no matter what, you know, where she came from, that she needs to feel like the Girl Scouts is where she belongs. And I, I think that's incredibly powerful, Marina. And I know that you've worked hard to some to do some of that. And I'm and we're all taking we're all taking your lead and, and using it in our own councils. So uh, we're we're launching a poll, and by the way, we we would welcome questions uh, from uh, those who are attending via Zoom. Uh, I know that those attending via uh, some of the social media feeds can't do it, uh, but please uh, ask any question you'd like. We'll try to to route them and uh, uh, to uh, our guests. Um, we just launched a poll. What does it mean to be like a girl? So um, it's going to be interesting to see uh, to see how that that unfolds. I'd like to pick up the the uh, this topic of belonging that Lydia uh, brought forth. Uh, one of the things that uh, we've seen in American institutions is that they grew up um, along uh, vectors of of, uh, of defined by race and wealth, and we're we're in a real discussion uh, today about how do you redefine those institutions, retaining the things that are valuable and positive about them but redefining them to be anti-racist and to actually be um, organizations that can be owned by everybody and affected by everybody. Meredith, how, how do you approach this in the greater New York area where you're, you're, you have this incredible history, this incredible legacy, um, and you have an embedded culture and, you're, and you are trying every day to shift that culture. How do you do that um, in ways that are uh, both obvious and conscious, and ways that just create an unconscious um, culture that allows for the belonging that Lydia described. Thank you. I think that uh, I think that the approach with redefining comes from intentional deconstructing. Intentional uh, deconstructing. Yeah, uh, we you know we are at we're at a point where uh, you know the accountability. Um, of every business, every nonprofit, every individual uh, lives in a public space and you have to walk the walk. You have to walk the talk. You have to actually have action steps. There is no just uh, lip service statements. Um, and I think that's an incredibly exciting place to be as a, as a society and as a culture to really hold each other accountable for what we're doing and what we're saying. And I think one of the most important laws that we have in Girl Scouts is responsible for what I say and do. And that to me really encompasses if we're going to if we're going to say this, we are going to do it and we're going to take action on it. Um, we teach our girls about taking action. That's that's always the final project of, of their work is about taking action um, and having it be meaningful. So I think I think what it, you know what it really means to me, like I said, is that intentional deconstructing of making sure, first of all, that we are representative of the communities we serve. Mm -hmm. uh, we need to have every voice at the table uh, in the decision-making process. That's within, within the staff, within the volunteers, within our board of directors. And we have to, we have to model uh, what and who our girls are. Uh, and then, you know, not positioning ourselves to be the ones who are in the know. Mm -hmm. We look at this last year, no one was in the know of what it is to be in a pandemic, social justice crisis, and a recession. None of us have been there before. There are no experts in this. And as we go into that uncharted territory, understanding that the bringing in the more diversity that you can bring in and, uh, and that sense of belonging needs to come from where they're seeing it in the action items. You feel like you belong when you can relate to, to what you see in individuals and what you see in the organization. Where does intentional deconstruction start? It's a hard, challenging process. And I will, I, I know that we're all going through this. It starts with really looking internally, historically, 
everything from our vernacular, all of all of the things that we are saying, the messages that we're putting out there, the embrace and the integration into communities and families and caregivers. Is it relevant? Uh, does it speak to them? Is it integrated into daily life that it becomes habitual and part of part of routine? Um, and again, I think words are so powerful and every message that we put out there has to have a focus of inclusivity and, uh, and belonging. It's one of the things that we asked when we asked this question, we just completed this poll. We said, what does it mean to do things like a girl? To cite some of the old cliches, what does it mean to throw like a girl but hit like a girl? And we had uh, three different types of answers. Like a girl means worse or without skill, 31% responded in that way, very traditional. Um, uh, male dominated definition. 13% uh, said like a girl means better or skillfully and like a girl means just differently but just as skillfully 56% uh, responded in that way. Are you redefining through this uh, intentional uh, uh, deconstruction as, as Meredith puts it or uh, as you put it about uh, a sense of belonging, uh, Lydia, are you redefining um, how society views people and taking the, the input of girls in creating that redefinition for a new generation? I think we absolutely are uh, having those conversations. I think that we also need to take the lead from girls. I think that they are the ones who can help us, partly because, as you said, and I disagreed that we are older, um, but as we are older, some of the, some of the societal constructs that we that we grew up in and you know we are we all have unconscious bias we all you know are trying to be uh, to learn new ways of thinking but uh, I think that you know they call this uh, generation C for generation COVID like there is a whole different way of understanding and I think that adults and I would say in the Girl Scout movement our leadership is trying to be humble listeners, because I think that that's one of the first steps to, to this is to really listen. Um, because we, we think as adults that we know what is best for our girls, but actually we need to take a take a beat and, uh, and create the, the brave space to just listen. And that is incredibly powerful and, and it's hard to do because as a mom, we all want, and I know all the parents who are listening, we all know exactly what our children should be doing, especially <laughs> in their 20s. But, Until they tell us that we're totally wrong, right? <laughs> so we need to just take a beat and listen. And right. I think that's where it starts. So, um, you know, it's, it, it's so very interesting. When, when we take a look at the changes, there's no area where the change is more evident than the Girl Scout cookie program, right? Because it starts off in a very traditionalist sense, and it's it, it's viewed in a in a uh, particular way. But the the cookie program of today and how it actually unfolds is a lot different than uh, it did 25 years ago, and 50 years ago, and 75 years ago. Um, Marina, could you talk a little bit about about that program and start to look at it? Uh, make it accessible to us as an educational tool, as an empowering tool, as a business tool, as an entrepreneurial tool, how it has actually evolved today and how it continues to evolve. Yeah, well, you know, think about it. We ran a cookie program in the middle of a pandemic this year and our girls and our volunteers and our staff and our bakers all worked together to figure out how are we going to do contactless uh, cookie program. And uh, it was pretty, pretty remarkable. So the girls were learning about e-commerce. And I'll give you a little story that I think is an example of the changes. Um, these were a group of girls who are in continuation high school. So they're in our Girl Scout program. Um, they, for various reasons of being involved in the juvenile justice system, are not in their regular high schools. They're in a Girl Scout program in their continuation high school. They did a cookie program this year. But as part of the curriculum preparing, they didn't just sell cookies. They learned about... Um, what it is to run a business, they came up with a business plan, how are they going to do it, what's their goal, how to present, how to do their pitch. One of our board members who is a marketing person for a private equity firm organized a group of women who then the girls presented to. The girls had spent about four weeks in their um, Girl Scout program planning their pitches, the reason for buying you know, and supporting their programs, making the case for it. 
And then a group of women mentors got on with the girls to mentor them, to have them present their pitches, to help them hone. The women were so excited because the girls were so well prepared. They said it was much better than most of the presentations that they ever see. Super empowering for the girls because they had this opportunity to present in a business case on Zoom, um, their business plan for their cookies. And then of course, the mentors also bought lots of cookies from the girls. That's really an example of it's more than just the sale. It's the whole program that sits behind it. It's opportunity. Now these girls have, have funds in their troop. And now also part of COVID resilience is planning for the future. They're planning for a trip and something that they're going to do. They're going to go do a ropes course, you know, which is awesome. So then that's going to get them outside. So yeah, that's just an example of the cookie program, I think there's a lot more to it than you see when you see the, you know, the girl out um, at the booth um, really developing her business skills, her confidence, her public speaking, her planning, um, and really building tomorrow's entrepreneurs. So yeah. We're really proud of the program. Lydia, you want to say something? Well, I, I just think, you know, it's it's interesting to me because I think what the cookie program for me, it, it, along with all the things that Marina has said, and I know Meredith, you, your girls are doing the same thing. I mean, I think that this resilience that, you know, I, that at the young, that at a young age, I remember one girl saying to me, you know, uh, I come from a background where my parents don't have resources to send me to do things, but I, I learned through the Girl Scout program that I could raise the funds to be able to do the things that I wanted to do. And I think, you know, I think back at our, uh, our founder, Julia Gordon Lowe, and that, I think that was sort of the thinking. It's like, how do you create, it's, it's a very, I mean, for 1912, very forward thinking when you think about, you know, the commercial cookie program started in 1923. And the whole concept was, no, we're not, we're not asking for a handout. We're not, we are going to create our own success because we are women, we are girls, we know how to do this. And we're gonna go after the things that are going to provide us the, the resources to be able to, to do what we, what we really care about. And I think that is, that is incredible. I, I mean, one of the things that has touched me, I, I also had my annual meeting on Saturday. One of the things that have touched me so much in our community, girls, you know, a percentage of the, of the sale of the cookies goes to the troop and to the girl for them to do their good works or whatever they wanna do. So many of these girls, we had this program called Cookies for COVID, where they could take their proceeds and buy food for their local uh, food pantries. And so many girls did that. I mean, to see a girl holding a bottle of Wesson oil, like it's gold because they raised the money to be able to buy you know, food for, for others. It just, it shows you that, that spirit of helping others, but the, also the spirit of, of being the actors that make the decision in their own world of what it is that they want to do with it. And I think that is powerful for the rest of your life to have had that opportunity to make those decisions. I know, Meredith, you have some great stories with your girls. You know, and, and that's, uh, I, I love, you know, the cookie program. Um, when you flip the, the conversation, I love having the, the conversation with the consumer. Uh, because from the consumer ends, look, who doesn't love a box of cookies? They, it's a win-win. You, 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 you know, have that exchange with a girl and you get a great product and you love it and it's heartwarming and it brings back memories, et cetera. And then I say, well, but look at that. Look at that process. You're talking about purchasing something from a five, seven, 10 year old girl uh, who makes a pitch, who has a plan of what she wants to do with, with her goals and uh, with the funds she receives. She knows how to upsell. She knows what to say. If you don't want a box of cookies, she can talk you into donating a box of cookies. She talks to you about her product, her inventory control of how many Thin Mints she still has left in her living room. Uh, she knows how to reorder inventory. And now with a digital system, she knows how to manage social media. She knows how to check her open rate on emails and response and thank yous. And that, that is that's a business model that a young girl has. And that tool like sets that, that win for when her first job interview, she's already made an ask. She's already done the work. She's already knows the process from A to Z. And I think that's the advantage that it positions girls, you know, and when we're looking at an unemployment rate across the country now that has drastically affected women, we're looking at a gap 
in the workforce in the next five to 10 years, these girls are there ready to fill that gap. And they're already trained. They're already knowledgeable. They're collaborative workers. They have all the skills. And that's, that's part of this job. That's part of this job is just preparing them for that future, which right now is more necessary than ever. And the poll is actually endorsing what you're saying. Um, that we asked what uh, what the most important skills are that learn uh, that girls learn from the cookie program. We have money management, goal setting, decision making, uh, people skills, business e business ethics. The whole idea here is that you take this program that started in 1923, and today it has as much impact in today's society. Uh, yet we're also, as you say, we're doing more bi-directional communication. You have uh, a pitch that is uh, being made by, uh, by girls who are fashioning themselves and preparing themselves as entrepreneurs. Uh, you have um, mentors who have already undertaken that journey, learning from the girls and enriching their own lives and contributing back. Um, we're coming to the end of our time. Um, let's go around the table uh, one more time. Uh, let's start with uh, you, Marina, um, and then we'll go to Meredith and, uh, and then Lydia. Let's talk about the future of Girl Scouts. How do you see the, the, um, the organization evolving into the future, given our, our times today? Yeah, I do think some of the most important work we're doing today is really intentional work to become a truly anti-racist organization and really digging deep to understand what that means to have courageous conversations about race um, and to really be the place where our nation is learning how to do that. Uh, we've been we've been working with an organization called Policy Link on that and. You know, when you think about, we're working with about 30,000 girls and 19,000 volunteers just in our council. If we can really work together in our council and then across the nation to really dig deep and understand how to be anti-racist, I think that's, the, that's such important work. And I will say our girls and our volunteers are so open to and excited about the work that we're, that we're doing um, in, the, in that space. So. That I think is, is it and getting girls outside, you know, mental health is a big issue and the combination and, and uh, empowering girls to be outside um, those and take action in their communities. So social justice, mental health, mental wellness, but it really starts with making sure that everyone can see themselves as belonging in Girl Scouts and we're doing the hard work required to get there. You're really talking about creating advocates for American civil society, right? Yes, but in a way that's not centered white, in a way that is like, who are we and who do we want to be and what will it take to get there and really having those conversations in a civil way where we're respecting each other, hearing each other. We formed with our volunteers what we call the Courage Cohort, and it is um, majority participants are people of color. Um, to really create a safe space to have those conversations to learn how do we bring this out and then we're doing similar work with our girls because we know that this really has to come from our, our members this work but I just think it's such important work um, for Girl Scouts but I also think we've always been about nurturing citizens um, and I think um, our perspective within Girl Scouts right now is that the work we're doing on racial justice and um, is just is really, really important um, work. Meredith, what do you see the future of Girl Scouts as being? Yeah, well, of course, I wholeheartedly agree with Marina and um, she's doing just incredible work at her council with that. And when you think about uh, the power of an organization um, and of course the accountability and responsibility that comes with that power, when she was saying, you know, 30,000 girls, 19,000, like we all have this, this community within each of our councils. And when you think of the halo effect that can happen, right? When we go through those educational tools and those challenging conversations, and it doesn't just change one person, it changes that person's halo and circle around through their conversations. And that is, that is so powerful as a movement as large and old as ours to be able to have. And I think that we are the right movement to be able to move that forward in a very, very productive, collaborative um, and successful way. I also think as a nonprofit, when do we ever get the opportunity to stop and pause the way we had to last March in March 13th, right? 
we move, we move at the pace, we keep going. Um, there's not a lot of reflective time in nonprofits because we're constantly problem solving. And for us, that opportunity to stop and redefine relevance in a heartbeat to make sure our community stayed connected, I think was the biggest gift we could ever have gotten. And to collect the data by moving to virtual platforms, collecting data, seeing where the sticky points are, using that knowledge that we now have to see what's post COVID look like? How is it relevant? How did we reach more girls? What were they interested in? That's a, that's a gift that I don't think, uh, I don't think we get more than once in a lifetime. So I'm really excited about what that will tell us about the direction we need to go in. Lydia will give you the last word. Tell well, us about the future. So I think, you know, I absolutely agree with my two colleagues. I think that we are, uh, as I think of this pandemic in the future, we are going to be in a COVID transformed world. It's not a post, it's not a back to normal. And I think that what I my hope, my big hope for our organization and our movement is that uh, just like what Meredith just said, that we're taking the opportunity to really prioritize what is important to our girls. And I think uh, the, you know, the whole stance around uh, social justice is something that our girls really care about. And, you know, quite honestly, as a, as a uh, citizen of this world and citizen of this country, I think that Girl Scouts is positioned in a way like nothing else to be a catalyst for good and a catalyst for change. And, uh, and, I, and I know that with my two sisters here on this uh, panel today that, you know, we're ready. We're ready to take it on and to, and to make the world a better place, which is what Girl Scouts are all about. Thank you so much. Uh, I, I'd like to thank you all. Meredith uh, Mascara of the Girl Scouts of Greater New York, Lydia Soto uh, Harmon um, of the Girl Scouts of the Nation's Capital in Washington, D.C., and uh, Marina Park, CEO of the Girl Scouts of Northern California. Thank you so much for... Uh, helping to increase my knowledge of this amazing uh, movement. And, and thank you, participants, guests, uh, attendees for uh, participating in this. Um, have a great day. Stay safe, everyone. And we'll see you on Thursday. <laughs>